high level, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to build from the ground up a financial institution geared just for the aging. Um, you know, so think about USAA as a financial institution just for military families. Um, we think that there's uh, a similar opportunity for um, people that are aging. Um, and in particular, um, this will all be um, familiar to you folks, but having it all in one place, everything is different as you age. Um, and this is something that everybody has talked about. Um, the decision making as a family to us is the critical piece of it. And so we're in the press a lot about um, you know, controls and algorithms and so on around um, detecting fraud and abuse. Um, but the key thing is that the family's involved and we build tools for, for the family to be involved. But everything down, down the board is, is different. You know, you're thinking about different risks, you're using, you know, money is coming out of savings rather than going into savings. Um, you use credit um, to create income rather than to make paper purchases. Um, tax and benefits planning is really critical, whereas um, for somebody who is still in the accumulation phase, it doesn't matter that much. Um, the things that you're saving for are different, your priorities are different. Everything is a little bit different. Um, Saying the same thing, um, but uh, the, the the thing that I would say most about the family role um, is that people think of independence as not needing any support, <clears throat> and I, I, we think of independence as having the support you need. Um, and the role of family is often to provide support in making wise decisions, um, but there aren't good tools around that. Uh, uh, I, you know, I would say also um, emphasizing holistic approaches to different financial services. So how do you make your insurance, your savings, the equity in your home um, play well together? And when you look at you know, even other diversified financial services institutions, you go to Fidelity, they do both investment products and insurance products like annuities, um, but they're on entirely different pages. And it's, you know, it's like, hey, do you want to buy an annuity? I got some annuities. Um, and it doesn't take account of what your savings look like or what you actually need. Um, and so we've sort of started with these particular things that are different about seniors and built a financial institution, you know, kind of with those things in order. Um, and, um, and I'll just, uh, you know, this is the, the debit card that we use that has um, family-based controls. So the idea is your family member can't spend your money, but they can help you avoid purchases that would be unwise. And the thing that we found is that, that there's almost always a pattern. Um, and so you see one charitable contribution, one late night TV purchase, um, there's going to be hundreds more. Um, and, um, and that's the kind of thing that it's very difficult at uh, a traditional financial institution. It, you know, a prosecutor can't go after it. Adult Protective Services can't go after it. Um, you know, and we do, we do all the way over to trust banking, so this is you know, California court accounting for uh, a special needs trust, which um, enables our particular person to uh, continue to receive Medicaid for long-term care, um, and you know, being able to issue debit cards and do long-term care planning through Medicaid is, is you know, cool. But um, that, that's, that's basically what we've built. Um, and the thing that I'll emphasize, and this is you know, both me talking about how great my coworkers are, um, but also, uh, I want to emphasize that it actually does matter that when you build services for seniors and you understand their needs, you know, we are, um, I, you know, I think genuinely the, the most um, uh, highest customer satisfaction financial institution in America. Um, and these are not people that love their banks, um, nor do, nor are banks super well loved in the, in the population. Um, so, so the thing that I would say is, is if you make these changes, it will, you know, your customers will notice it and appreciate it. Um, so, that, so now just me trying to uh, stir up the bees a little bit. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of dive into five super, super fast um, controversial arguments, I guess. Um, uh, one is that, um, that you think about prosecution um, and, you know, half of the time it's somebody who's abroad, half of the time it's, you know, thousands of $20 transactions. And as we all know, you know, the, the Liz mentioned the reporting rate, you know, one in 45, right? So let's say we
we all got our heads together. We did huge awareness campaigns, and we tripled that. You know, now you're at one in fifteen. Um, you know, it's just you know, what are, what are you going to do? How are you going to attack this problem? You know, if, if one in fifteen is reported, what percent of people end up in jail? To say nothing of what percent of people's funds end up returned to them or protected in some way. Uh, and so, thinking about early detection, thinking about uh, intervention up front. You know, the, the things that you would do if you know Ebola was out, was you know spreading at the rate that financial abuse is spreading. Um, the second thing is is a legal framework for shared decision making. So, so when Michael was saying, I really want to be able to call the son or daughter. Um, the point is that in the legal system and the banking system, either you have a power of attorney or you don't. Either you're legally competent or you aren't. Um, and uh, and flipping that switch is this. It's a really big thing. Um, I think financial institutions are terrified to uh, have evidence that their customer is cognitively impaired because the moment you say, wow, I've spotted these warning signs, then all of a sudden your fiduciary duty kicks in, you're on the hook, all of the transactions are reversible. Um, if you continue to facilitate payments on their behalf, they can come back and say, well, you knew that I was cognitively impaired and you still gave away all my money even though I wasn't legally competent. I mean, it's just, you know, in a lot of cases, you just don't want to know. Um, and so being able to say, here's a gray area, here's a person that can <laughs> wisely make some decisions and not others, you know, it's just, it's this thing that nobody's able to do because our legal system doesn't have a, um, a designation between completely competent and completely incompetent. Um, I'm going to skip the third one because it's my least favorite. Um, fourth, fourth comment, um, when you retire, um, you know, it used to be that you had 10 useful years, um, and so you put it all into bonds and, and not into stocks. Now you might have 30 years left, um, which means that you actually need to grow your money. Over 30 years, you know, you should put, put money in the stock market, um, and yet everybody uh, preaches a conservative approach because that's what seniors want. They don't want to see, they don't want to see their money go down. Um, and we've seen, you know, in our, in our financial advisory practice, it's this race to lowest growth um, and every time you're not growing a senior's money, you're contributing to this crisis. Um, and yet, you know, there's no good way to talk about that. Um, and then finally, I mean, this is totally irrelevant for almost everyone in this room, but there's this new um, provision that Congress passed called the JOBS Act that enables people to invest in new and exciting ways. You know, you think about crowdfunding sites, um, small dollar angel investing, stuff like that. And um, I just try to tell everybody, Face, that when somebody discovers, and it will happen, that instead of uh, you know telling people to buy you know the, the sort of car protection for the car they don't have, if you're all of a sudden you realize that it's absolutely legal to pitch them entirely speculative investment products, um, that you can tell them almost nothing about it and still get away with it, and it's this sort of buyer beware model. You know, instead of the thousand dollars a month for the car club, it's you know a quarter million dollars, and you can buy a soccer list and somebody's going to do it, and that's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Greg.